that a few more folks have joined us. So uh, let's kick off our webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Priya from Prudential Singapore, and thanks so, many, so much for joining us today uh, for our webinar. Uh, today's uh, webinar is jointly organized by Britcham and, and Prudential, and our topic today is healthy aging in a digital world. So healthy aging is a key focus for us because, you know, we all want to enable people to live well and independently for as long as possible. And it can be a bit challenging in Singapore, of course, with our rapidly aging population, people who are living longer lives, uh, average lifespan here being about 83 years. Uh, today, we want to discuss how health tech can support us. Uh, how can industry players in the ecosystem come together uh, to play a part in making healthcare more affordable, accessible for the aging population? Okay, today we're going to be hearing from some of the ecosystem's <laughs> key participants uh, who are going to be speaking about these critical issues and how we can leverage digital tech to, emerging, uh, to address emerging uh, health needs. Uh, moderating today's session uh, is Dr. James Lam. Uh, Dr. Lam is the CEO of Mount Alvernia Hospital. He's an industry veteran, more than 20 years of experience in the industry. And I'm now going to hand over to him uh, to take you through the rest of the webinar. Dr. Lam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Priya, for that kind introduction. Makes me feel a little bit old, uh, 20 years veteran. Wise, wise. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well welcome everyone uh, to our panel discussion on an important topic that is uh, relevant and probably close to our hearts, uh, which is healthy aging in the digital world. As we all know, uh, rapidly aging populations and increased longevity have made healthy aging a key focus across the world to enable people to live well and independently as long as possible, including Singapore. In 2015, 11.7% of Singaporeans were 65 or older, and the UN estimates that by 2035, this will more than double to 26.6%. Furthermore, life expectancy has risen to 83.1 years in 2017, from 76.9 in 1997. Singapore's rapid aging will accelerate in the coming 15 years, shifting the country's disease load. In particular, a greater proportion of people will need to manage one or more chronic diseases. Singaporeans will be hard pressed to cope with the health related expenses of living up to 100 years old, as a greater number of us will need to manage more than one chronic disease in our old age. This is according to nearly half, 49%, of the 200 healthcare practitioners surveyed in, surveyed in Prudential Singapore's Healthy for 100 study, which was researched and written by the Economist Intelligence Unit. With healthcare costs around the world increasing, and for countries with an aging population, this is an increasingly worrying trend. Singapore's rapidly aging population and growing rates of multi-morbidity are contributing to a growing demand for healthcare services. To ensure Singaporeans have access to affordable medical services and insurance in the long run, both healthcare players and providers have an important role to play. Digital health is also found to be one of the most promising growth sectors in the healthcare industry. Accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic and an intensification of funds flowing into digital health startups in recent years, the digital transformation of healthcare is gathering pace across the world. Digital tools have been proven to be safe, effective, cost-efficient, and easily accessible for patients, consumers, and healthcare providers. With an increasing focus on technology as a viable long-term solution for tackling some of the pressing health challenges facing our society, along with a greater awareness about the importance of leading healthier lifestyles, 
we need definitely to maintain a positive mindset on the adoption of digital health tools. We are very privileged today, right, to have with us a diverse panel to discuss all these critical issues. By way of introduction, we have with us Dr. Siddharth Karu, Medical Director and Head, Medical Portfolio Management, Prudential Singapore. Dr. Siddharth leads Prudential Singapore's medical portfolio and is responsible for providing solutions to achieve sustainable metrics for Prudential's health insurance business. His role includes development and implementation of management initiatives related to medical business, as well as supporting cross-functional teams in developing long-term healthcare models, both on the digital and conventional platforms. We also have with us Dr. Adrian Hater, National Clinical Director for Older People and Integrated Person-Centric Care, NHS England and NHS Improvement. Dr. Hater's career is in general practice and he continues to work clinical sessions up to today. He's passionate about the role of GPs, not only in the delivery of healthcare, but also in leading health systems by working to improve the health of populations within allocated health resources. He became a board member of the Windsor and Escort Primary Care Group in 1999 and took on a lead role for older people's services, developing local force services and working with the local authority on an older people's partnership board. Last but definitely not least, we have with us Mr. Jonathan Lau, CEO of Nervotech. Jonathan is the founder of Nervotech Private Limited, responsible for leveraging remote vital signs monitoring and deep neural networks to transform the way people access healthcare. Through its technologies, Novotech is transforming the way people across healthcare, truly enabling healthcare anywhere. So maybe I'll get the, the panel discussion going. Uh, with the first question, and this will be open to all our panelists. Um, with the world's rapidly aging demographic, how well equipped uh, do you think the population in Singapore and the UK are in planning for their future healthcare needs? Perhaps I can get um, Dr. Adrian to get the ball rolling, right, to address these challenges from the UK's uh, perspective. Uh, Adrian, over to you. Thank you very much, James. And um, thank you for inviting me to your, to your um, conference today, your webinar today. And um, it's a pleasure because um, um, the two countries which are very dear to my heart are here in England um, where I'm working, but also Singapore um, where my family, uh, my mum's family um, originate from. So, um, so I'm really pleased to be here today and to give you that little bit of a perspective from, from, um, from England, but also the rest of the UK. Um, I've been a GP for 25 years and, um, and over that time, as you quite rightly say, I've just noticed the, um, that people are aging and are living older. Um, I, had a, I have a patient who I've had throughout those 25 years um, who died just recently and she reached the age of 103 and I was privileged to look after her care for all of that life spent, you know, that period of time. Um, and, and, and I noticed now that we've got people in their 90s coming in um, and they walk into the surgery. Um, my my mum and dad are in their late 80s um, and um, I have aunts in, in, in Singapore who are living into their late 90s. And um, so, so this aging population has been because of healthcare over this last quarter of a century. Um, the NHS um, has just celebrated its 74th um, birthday, um, and throughout that um, uh, time, the NHS um, has been making uh, changes to respond 
and I think you know the the, the changes that I, I've noticed is that we're we're moving from um, a, a healthcare, which which I think a lot of investment has gone into hospital into the hospital sector um, over um, many decades, but actually we're realizing that we need to think about um, healthcare in a much more um, wider sense and to be really thinking about um, how, what what we've got in the community to be able to support people to live longer, live healthier, and to be enabled um, to live um, their lives into a, a good old age. Um, and I think we we need to think of that um, through the lens of integration. Um, and I think that lens of integration is really important. And what we mean by that, I think, is not just thinking about um, the medical or kind of clinical perspective on healthcare. Uh, we need to be thinking about um, the wider determinants of health and what is important to individuals. And so the, in, in England, the things that we are doing to structure that are, is we've moved um, to a new system of integrated healthcare where we're actually taking that more into account um, going forward in the future. And I think that's really important. And then the pandemic has shown us that digital technology, as you say, um, is really important. And I think that digital technology can be enabled, not only the high tech um, in hospital kind of care, as you're, you know, you, you, you're, in a, you're in a very high tech hospital um, group, um, uh, James, where, where, where a lot of digital technology has been invested. And in the UK, just before the pandemic or just about when the pandemic was starting, we invested in all the kind of the tech that goes into to, to acute um, respiratory illness around um, assisted ventilation. But we also detected in some very low level tech, which was around pulse oximetry in the community to be able to support people um, in this in this um, world of COVID. Um, and then the last point I really wanted to make was around the importance um, going forward of thinking about um, health inequality. And I think we have to be able to think about not only the people that will come forward to us, and we've learned that through the vaccination program in England and in, in the UK, that we can't just um, expect people to come to us. We need to be able to enable people to make really good choices in life. And not only from the vaccination program perspective, but from wider than that. And, and so in, in England, we have launched something called the Core 20 Plus 5, which is really kind of thinking about how we hone in on those people who um, have long-term conditions, um, but also can suffer from health inequalities and do things differently to make their lives and to include them in the healthcare that we're delivering. So, so I think that package of care going all the way through now to support older people in the community and grow and be healthy aging is really important. And this is also taken forward with the WHO in the ICOPE strategy, which is an international strategy around integrated care for older people. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, actually, Singapore, we can associate with this movement um, very well. We have a newly launched initiative called Healthier SG. I think in the past decades, we put in a lot of resources, like what you have shared, into tertiary care, right? And we, we, we have noticed that a lot more can be done at the community care and personal ownership level. So with that point, maybe I, I now invite uh, um, Siddharth to, to share with us, right, from the, the Singapore perspective, like how well equipped do you think we are to, to, to deal with this um, aging demographics, Siddharth? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James, and uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, uh, first of all, there's nothing left for me to say because uh, whatever Adrian was saying and before that, whatever you said, James, it sort of fits into the picture for Singapore completely, right? So I don't really know, do I have something more to add? Uh, but, but having said that, probably I, I would just uh, uh, take a shot at that. And I would like to sort of go back to some key data points that James, you shared and which are very important to the context of what we are discussing right now. I think the three key data points that I would like to repeat for everyone here on this webinar is that Singapore today has the highest longevity in the world. That's number one. Number two, by 2030, one in five Singaporeans will be above 65. That means roughly 20% of the population would be above 65. 
And the third data point is that today, one in four Singaporeans above the age of 40 have at least one chronic health condition. And this is information available in the public domain. You can visit the Health Promotion Board Ministry of Health website to sort of look at this data. Now, if you, if you sort of triangulate all these data points together, what does it mean for Singapore? It actually means for Singapore that we do have an aging society at hand, which is aging, which is going to live long. But this also implies that while Singaporeans are living longer, they might not be living healthier. So keeping this background in mind, keeping this background in mind, Prudential in the recent past, we commissioned a couple of surveys where we basically reached out to two different sets of people. You know? uh, one, the residents of Singapore and the other, the healthcare practitioners in Singapore to understand uh, their context in terms of how they feel about longevity and what are their concerns. Now, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the concerns or the points or the observations made by the residents and the healthcare practitioners separately were very much aligned in terms of where they see Singapore heading towards, you know, in terms of this longevity and aging context. So across the board, what we really saw that the key concern was the rising healthcare costs. And the concern of Singaporeans that as they live longer, uh, would they be able to afford healthcare costs in the future? you know, when they are old, right? And they also understood that this is primarily happening or going to happen because people are going to develop at least one, if not more, but probably more than one chronic health condition. So there could be a lot of people living with multiple comorbidities. So when we spoke to the doctors around this, when we spoke to the doctors, I think, I think from the doctors, we got consistently the same message that Singaporeans are definitely underprepared for the health related expenses if we are going to live up to 100 you know and the other message that we got was that going forward the solution would be preventive health care there has to be a huge emphasis and that sort of links back to what you just mentioned james about you know the healthier singapore program being launched and the government really now investing lots of time effort and money onto these wellness programs right at the same time what we heard from healthcare practitioners as well as the residents was that at the end of the day it's the residents who have to be responsible and take initiative for managing their health and managing their future health in terms of aging in a very healthy manner. And what was also interesting that when we reached out to youngsters, there was a lot of understanding about preventive healthcare, but people were not doing really anything about it because everybody was busy with something or the other, but preventive healthcare was on their minds, but nothing was done proactively to sort of uh, follow preventive healthcare. And again, there was a huge feedback, especially from the healthcare practitioners, that we need to invest more in healthcare technologies because that is the future that's going to help the chronic disease care. And lastly, everybody in Singapore, when we spoke to the healthcare practitioners, believed that there is a lack of integration uh, between the primary care, the secondary care, the tertiary care, long-term care and home care. And, and that really needs to be integrated more in order to reduce inefficiencies, hospitalization time and costs. So what is the future for Singapore from this, you know, the, 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 these observations that I have made in terms of managing our aging population? To me, the key messages definitely are one, that prevention is always better than protection. So prevention, for in the long run for the aging population has to take precedence over protection, you know? So, so that's, and, and there's a very old English saying that says prevention is better than cure. So definitely prevention has to take precedence over protection. But at the same time, if prevention has to happen as a society, as a country, that has to start early. It's not that you can just Think of it when you are in your 60s and say, okay, now let me start taking care of my health. That really doesn't work. So it has to start early. In this whole discourse around preventive care, we believe that technology has a major part to play going forward in the future. So technology is here to stay and will play a main part, a huge part rather, in the preventative care ecosystem. And lastly, if we have to bring the healthcare costs down at the end of the day, there has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. It's not that it's one person's job. So whether it's the government, whether it's the healthcare providers, the residents, 
the employers or the insurers. All of us have to work together in this healthcare ecosystem to actually uh, manage the future health of the citizens and bring the healthcare uh, costs down. So, so that's where we are heading and that's where we as Prudential are looking forward to invest in, invest our efforts into all these strategies so that we can really, uh, you know, support people living to a healthy 100 instead of just living to 100. Yeah, thanks, James. Back to you. Thank you, Sira. Um, so, Jonathan, we have, we have heard the, the need, right, for, for individuals, for community, right, to do more, right, on preventative healthcare instead of uh, managing chronic illnesses. And uh, both Adrian and Sita have shared that they think uh, there's a big role for technology to, you know, to, to play. So from the, the lens of a health tech entrepreneur, uh, could you share what are the opportunities and perhaps maybe some challenges that lay ahead for us, right, to, to manage this rapidly aging uh, demographic? Uh, Jonathan, thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Lam. Uh, first of all, really excited to be uh, here. I think it's, it's also uh, useful if I give a short intro about what Nervotech does and, and why I'm being flagged by doctors all around me, very, very well respected in their field. So I'm, I'm the founder of Nervotech and uh, we are a digital health company that's found a way to, with just a, a video feed, any video feed, even the one that's on the, the Zoom now, uh, to get medical grade vital signs from just analyzing the PPG signals that we can extract from your face. Uh, so what this means is all the benefits that we are seeing from wellness platforms that have some sort of integrations with uh, wearables and, and how companies are slowly shifting towards a value-based healthcare system, uh, these benefits can now be also leveraged or enjoyed by customers that uh, either have no disposable income to uh, buy a wearable or uh, even if they own one, they don't wear one as often as they should just by engaging your phone as you will uh, four to five hours on average a day. Uh, we have the ability to now monitor your vital signs and tell you what's wrong uh, with you uh, with the use of predictive uh, analytics through our AI systems. So with that being said, I, I completely agree with the uh, pointers raised by uh, Dr. Sihat. Yes, uh, the, the, the key here is, is not just to focus on one group, right? To say uh, multi-morbidity uh, or chronic patients or, or elderly uh, users. The key is to really instill that that acceptance of leveraging technology across all ages and genders and, and ethnicities, right? So the, the key or the value proposition that we're bringing is, is just by engaging your phone, uh, the, the ideal endpoint is have something monitor your health, uh, have it analyze the trending information that it receives from, from all the measurements, and then push it to your GP, for example, for, for that relationship to start from a very young age, or, or even if you're now already an elderly patient, uh, have that with, you know, it can be a, a Zoom call of your loved ones, for example, and have that uh, measurements passed on to your GP uh, and have that kind of uh, monitoring done across uh, all ages. So to also circle back to your mention of Healthy SG, uh, the main pillar is about to know what you can do better for your own health, for a better quality of life. And that's very really um, trying to, to, enable the users of a technology to find out what's going on, what can I do better in my life uh, to just enjoy a, a better quality of care. So the challenges in this field, obviously, is it's really where Nevertech was, uh, the, the genesis of Nevertech came about. Uh, we saw the difficulties in, in just having to encourage the wearable adoption. I think Singapore is a good example for that, uh, free wearables for anybody that wants one. Uh, yet we still see engagement rates are, are relatively low uh, in terms of, of wearing that wearable or even claiming the free one from any post office uh, via the Healthy Steps Challenge. Um, and and that, that is, is it, it's, it's identified a gap of individual users that are not ready to change these habits to even embark on this journey for a, a better quality of life. Uh, so the idea now is why don't you continue enjoying your TikTok or your Instagram stories or, or your news feeds. And, and while you're doing that, have your health uh, monitored. And if you don't like to be reminded that you need to do something, then this information can be passed on with your permission, of course, to your GP. And then during your consults with your GP, have a, a little bit more insightful discussion about what kind of habits you should be adopting uh, to improve your quality of life. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I think for, for healthcare providers, 
non-compliance is a huge challenge. So I think for patients uh, with illnesses, right, uh, uh, easier way of monitoring their symptoms uh, definitely would help. And I think since we're talking about preventive health, we are talking about nagging maybe the young ones to adopt healthier lifestyles uh, even before they, they fall ill, you know. So on that, perhaps I could ask um, um, Adrian, why is it so important to start um, preventative healthcare from a young age? A very, very wide, wide open question. And I'll ask um, Siddharth to comment after that as well. Adrian? Thank you, um, <laughs> James. Um, it's very interesting, actually, because uh, you know uh, uh, Siddharth um, um, mentioned the uh, proverb: um, "Prevention is better than cure." Um, and it, 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 in England, we also like Chinese proverbs. Um, so um, I wanted to read you out this Chinese pro proverb, which I've just tweeted: um, "The superior doctor prevents sickness." The mediocre doctor attends to impending sickness, and the inferior doctor treats actual sickness. So, um, so, um, but, but not to not to uh, disingenuously kind of uh, talk about colleagues in the acute sector who are doing great jobs, really, in terms of treating sickness. Um, but, but the prevention agenda is really important, and I think. Um, a couple of things um, that um, we know. Um, one is that um, um, in terms of aging, we, we, we can understand the concept of frailty. And that is also around kind of thinking about multimorbidity, just as we've talked about. Um, but also um, in terms of frailty, which takes an approach which actually in, 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 in England and, and, and through um, work like the comprehensive geriatric assessment takes a, a different approach to looking after um, people as they age with multiple long term conditions, but also with losing some of that intrinsic capacity that um, people lose as they get older. Um, we can actually think about reversing some of that or slowing down that progress around, uh, around older people um, and frailty. So that's the first thing, which is at the more acute end. Um, the other end is also um, by, by paying attention to the very simple things that are important, um, such as our eyesight, our hearing, um, some of the things that we um, can um, and exercise and mobility and muscle strength, we can also um, um, join in this prevention agenda. My mum is 86 and um, she, she had a nursing career and she, um, after she finished her nursing career, she developed osteoarthritis of her hip. She had a hip replacement and then she took up tennis and she plays tennis three times a week. And so her um, way of supporting her intrinsic capacity, her muscle strength, is to exercise. She has fun doing it. She goes to her club. She she plays with friends, and that helps. Now, in whatever your activity or your sport or your way of um, living, it's really important as we age to be able to not when we develop arthritis think that um, you know our life is um, now going to be a chair bound lifestyle it's about kind of making sure that we can kind of um, get connected to our communities and join in the things that are fun and make exercise one of the things that we do on a regular basis and I think there's a lot of um, support that we can do that in, in Singapore you, you develop lots of cycling kind of um, opportunities for people um, and there are other opportunities to be able to embrace um, in the community, a lifestyle that can help with this prevention agenda. And we kind of, I think we, we sometimes don't think about that or we don't make the most of those opportunities to um, live and age uh, more healthily. Um, and the digital element is really important because um, as, as Jonathan was saying, this is about um, a community and linking into people and family and friends and, and being able to um, make it part of what we're doing um, and having fun in, in our older age. Um, so, so I, you know, so James, I think, I think the, the, the aim is really kind of to think about that prevention, not in terms of, you know, um, 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 if you like, a, um, a prevention program, which, which, is, um, which is adopted by the NHS, it's actually about weaving it into people's lives. Thanks, Adrian. Your mom is really impressive. 
I think I should exercise more. <laughs> Sit up, would you like to, to share your thoughts on, on, on why is it important to start prevent, preventative uh, healthcare young? Sit up, thanks. Yeah, thanks, James. I, I, I think, <laughs> to be honest, this is the holy grail question, yeah? And, and I'll try to explain why, you know? So, you see, and since it's the season of Proverbs, uh, uh, we just heard another one from Adrian, so maybe I follow up with another one, which is, again, a very old but famous English proverb which says, a stitch in time saves nine. So if you look at this context of, you know, why we should be starting early in terms of managing our health, I think before I talk about that, probably what, what is interesting and important to understand is that, and I probably am repeating that, is that individuals are at the end of the day responsible for their own health you know so so what that means that we all need to take responsibility for supporting our own healthy aging as we know that the society is aging and as we know that longevity is there so it's a fact at the same time you know uh, and, and i'm talking from a singapore context when we reached out to the residents when we spoke to healthcare practitioners uh, the, the way in, interesting feedback that came to us was that youngsters between the age groups of 25 to 45, they are not taking the initiative to proactively prevent common chronic conditions, which could be easily managed if there was a healthy lifestyle in place. So now the question is that how do we, how do we really get them to understand this? You know, whilst they know it, but they're not doing anything about it. And it's, it's like, you know, you, you, can, you can take a horse to the well or to the river, but how do you make the horse drink the water, right? So, so that, that's a big challenge. And that's where probably where Adrian is coming from is that, you know, what he just talked about, how do we build technology into this perspective? How do we really make things fun and interesting for this generation? Because you see, as I explained previously as well, you cannot be saying that, okay, now I'm 70 years old and now I start looking after my health. Now I need to focus on how do I age, but in a healthy manner. It's, it's not that way. It doesn't happen that way. So you have to start young. You have to start early. So therefore, how do we do it? And to be very honest, we don't have the answers. We don't know because people have tried different methodologies. Uh, now, Look at Singapore, you know, here there's a huge thrust on preventive health care. If you look at the efforts put in by the Ministry of Health, the Health Promotion Board, reaching out to targeted segments of the population. And in spite of those many efforts, there's still a huge chunk of people, young adults, who really are not taking initiatives around this. So how do we get more and more people involved into this? Because this is where we would be reaping benefits in the next decades to come. If people start young, start early, you would see in 30 or 40 years down the line that the chronic conditions, the healthcare expenditures around chronic conditions, the other comorbidities, we would be seeing less of a healthcare impact, right? So, so that's, that's the question. And honestly, how do we make people do that? And lastly, what's also important is that how do we as healthcare financiers, and when I say we, I'm referring to the insurance sector, right? Uh, so whilst there's healthcare providers, which is people like you who are delivering healthcare services at the hospital end, right? But as healthcare financiers, how do we really get in technology to support people uh, from a young age in terms of building their health, in terms of looking after their health and taking initiatives? Whilst we have taken steps at Prudential uh, in terms of bringing that technology in for the concept uh, for the preventative healthcare, but that's something as a society, as stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, we really need to think through. I do not think any of us today has the right answers or has the has the solution to uh, start pushing people to start this activity at an early stage. That's that's my thought on this. Back to you, James. Sorry, you are on mute, James. I'm sorry. Thanks, Sedat. I was saying that uh, since we have the healthcare financier at the mic, uh, and then perhaps I could ask another question, right? Uh, we, now we, we all know, know the need uh, to take up ownership, to start young. Prevention is better than cure, right? Integration across various elements of the society is important. But as medical costs continue to rise, how can industry players make healthcare 
more affordable and accessible. Sita, I may I'll start with you and then I will pass on to Adrian and then uh, Jonathan. Thanks, Sita. Yeah, sure. So th this is a great question actually, because we, we have been, as an insurer, we have been struggling with this as well, that what is the right way of approaching our customers who in our terms are our policyholders, right? And how do we make healthcare and in our context, it's more how do they access healthcare, the way they pay for healthcare? How do we make it fair and how do we make it affordable for them? And how do we, in a way, link this to the encouragement about staying healthy, right? So, so these are sort of all points, all parameters that if you sort of link them together, you, you could come out with some sort of a solution. So what we did at Prudential, and this is something which was very unique to the market in Singapore, we said, hey guys, look, why don't you start being healthy? And if you are healthy and you are not coming to me with any health-related claims, you are not coming to me with any health-related issues, which I believe is because you are leading a healthy lifestyle, I will reward you for that. Well, that was a very unique concept started in Singapore by Prudential a couple of years back. And reward was like in the form of financial benefits, very tangible benefits that the policyholder, the customer could actually see. So what we did, we said that if you are healthy and you do not have any health problems, and we observe that because we do not have any health claims from you, we will award you with the 20%. Now, James, that's a big number, huh? 20%. We'll award you with a 20% discount on your premiums that you are supposed to pay us next year. And that really helped. So today we have almost 80% of our policyholders, if not more, for certain health insurance plans that are availing this benefit from us of seeking 20% premium reduction year on year because they, they are putting in that extra effort to actually uh, stay healthy and not get hospitalized. So that's how what we are looking at is again prevention, right? What we are looking at is that look, we are a wellness company we want you to be healthy and well. It's not about the conventional insurance outreach. I'll pay your claim when you're sick or when you die. And that's where my relationship with you ends. And at the same time, you see, we, we also told the people who are not keeping well, we said, guys, you are not taking good care of your health. So what that actually means that you are coming back again and again with your claims related to your health. That means you're really not following up wherever it's possible. So we did the other way around. We said, for you, we're sorry, but till you don't take care of your health, we are going to increase your premiums because this tells us that you're not serious about healthcare. Now, whilst there are things which are outside the control of a person that we understand, but there are other things that you could actually sort of strive for, which is managing your healthcare. And it really worked for us. So today, uh, we are a company where, and, and probably I take pride in saying that, that we are a company that is the only company in Singapore which is linking your benefits, your rewards to your healthcare at the time of renewal. And that's how we are really actually trying to see that this healthcare is affordable and accessible for the customers that we have. At the same time, what we have also done is that we have entered into strategic partnerships with key healthcare providers in the country, where we are trying to say that, guys, you know, it's, it's like a healthcare management organization, the concept overall, right? So we are saying that, if you want to keep this healthcare affordable, why don't you work together with our partners where we can really provide excellent healthcare at affordable prices? So it sort of is a win-win for all the stakeholders. And that's also very important in the long run because uh, if you would have seen, and this has been in the press for a long time, uh, from a healthcare financing perspective, you know, people are not very comfortable with the sustainability of healthcare in terms of paying the premiums, in terms of the premiums increasing year on year. So how do we sort of break this jinx in a way? Yeah? How do we do that? And this is where we are trying to pitch in. We are trying to encourage wellness. This is where we are trying to reward healthy behavior. This is where we are trying to penalize unhealthy behavior. And this is where we are trying to bring in a healthcare ecosystem with trusted partners where we can actually deliver great healthcare at very affordable prices. And that sort of helps us in keeping healthcare sustainable for our customers. So, and, and we are striving, we're trying even more new things around that, but the key is how do we keep it sustainable? Otherwise, the way the expenses are growing, 
the way healthcare costs are growing all over the world and specifically in Singapore and the feedback you heard from our customers, which I alluded to at the beginning of this conversation, almost every person is worried, how do they pay for their healthcare bills? How do they pay for their private healthcare expenditure once they grow old? And this is a matter of serious concern for everyone, for, for, the, for the regulators, for the policymakers, for insurers, for employers, everybody who's a part of this ecosystem. And I think we as Prudential, we are trying our best to play a very positive part in this in order to make this ecosystem sustainable. Back to you, James. Thank you, Sigar. Well, it sounds like you're putting real skin in the game, right? With tangible, you know, financial acknowledgement uh, for policyholders that play their part. And we practice like, what we preach, James. We yeah. practice what we preach. <laughs> and and it's, it's really rewarding health promotion and not yeah. just doing health care. Right. Yeah. So, so could I ask the same um, question to, to Adrian? And would you yeah. like to share our thoughts, Adrian? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and Siddharth, I mean, I think that's that's fantastic in terms of the way that you've approached that. And um, and almost I was thinking kind of, you know, a very much a behavioral science type of approach to 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 supporting um, uh, your, your, your residents in Singapore to live healthier lifestyles through 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 the insurance um, payment system. Obviously, in England and in the UK, we have a we have a different payment system where the NHS is, um, you know, free at the point of uh, of healthcare for individuals. So we have to adopt a different approach, and you know, but but some of that approach, I think, in terms of thinking about behavioural science and and in, in incentivising and. And, and ensuring that um, um, people um, understand the benefits of a healthy lifestyle is something that we're building into our integrated care systems. So I just wanted to just explain a little bit more about that this term integrated care systems. So we have got in, in England 42 integrated care systems which have been set up. And this involves partnerships between health and social care and, and the wider, um, wider communities that um, they encompass. Um, and um, within that, there is a budget and there's budgets for health care and there's budgets um, for social care, um, which um, people receive the benefit of. And obviously that's paid through taxation and through through um, through through individuals. Um, and we've got to cope at the moment with the cost of living crisis as well. Oil and gas prices and everything else is one of the real factors that um, people are concerned about paying those bills and um, might take over you know, some of their priorities around kind of some of the other healthcare activities. But what we're doing is devolving down some of that responsibility from those 42 ICSs much down to a place, to a local level, to a place, what we call a place level, which might be much bigger, um, uh, much, much smaller populations within the ICS, and then down to a neighbourhood level, which even, even smaller populations of around 50,000 people. Um, and within those smaller populations, around 50,000 people, what we're trying to do is invest in some of those um, things where people can be supported to live healthy, more healthy lifestyles. Um, and we've got a number of in initiatives. We've, um, in general practice, where I work and where, where, where I'm part of, we have lots of additional roles. And in, within those additional roles, there are social prescribers um, and, and um, health coaches. And these are people who really can, through, pop, through population health intelligence tools, we, we're knowing our population and understanding where the issues and problems are, where multimorbidity, where frailty lies, where people um, actually are living um, worse um, lifestyles, their, um, their diabetes isn't well controlled, or their hypertension isn't well controlled. We can then target those people with a different offer, which is not about um, a, a tablet for every cure, um, uh, for every ailment, uh, but rather than that, um, thinking about much more of the healthier lifestyle options and, and linking in to what resources are within the community to be able to do that, whether it's exercise, dietary, um, we've got a big di diabetes prevention program, which is all about healthy eating and healthy lifestyles. And so through this integrated care system way of working, devolving that down to a neighborhood level, thinking about what resources are in those neighborhoods to be able to support people um, in those neighborhoods. And for example, in Singapore, you've got, um, you know, um, very good structures around kind of um, neighborhoods and kind of um, you've got HDB and, and food outlets, thinking about the resources within there to encourage people to live within, uh, live a more healthy lifestyle 
is what we are using um, to be able to help nudge people um, into the right way of living those healthier lifestyles. Um, and I think, I think um, in England, I think some of this is a much more of a long-term aim um, around kind of, you know, how we get that prevention, how we get it embedded into our communities. Um, and also thinking about the other options, opportunities around volunteering and supporting kind of um, those communities to, to, um, to support the greener agenda as well. Um, the sustainability agenda is really important. So, so for, from, a, from, a, from an England perspective, we're, we're thinking about having kind of a resource thinking about using that resource wisely, thinking at a system level of allocating that resource and thinking of a local level of making best use of that resource um, that's given to that population to improve the health outcomes um, at that neighbourhood level. Um, and we can track that and we can um, understand how that's going on in the future. And that population health intelligence, I can't underestimate the value of that. And, you know, Sid talked about kind of um, understanding what's happening in Singapore, but we can understand understand at a very local level and I can understand that from looking at my system my my neighborhood and what all our practices are doing and we've got that population health in, uh, intelligence approach um, we can really target the areas that really need to be targeted um, those people and put more resources into those and and hopefully some of the other resources in terms of the community resources can support people living the healthier lifestyles so that's so from from our perspective in, in england it's a slightly different um, process but actually i think in terms of using some of the behavioral science in terms of thinking about your communities Think about the population health tools that we've got to be able to identify and support people, not only in terms of healthcare needs, but social care needs as well. We've got some of those things which we're building. Thank you, Adrian. If you don't mind, I feel quite compelled to ask you a couple of follow-up full -up questions. Um, the first one is that all your um, integrated care systems, right, which are the smaller systems, are they free to, to pursue their own programs and uh, how do they share their, their you know, best learning and best practices? Yeah. That's the first question. And the second one, I think you're familiar with uh, Singapore's effort. We are just taking our first steps toward healthier, healthier SG and uh, a more cluster approach. Sounds quite similar to your ICSs. Yeah. And perhaps you could share some wise advice what to watch out for and the pitfalls, you know, yes. um, with us, I, I don't think we have MOH friends here, but I myself would be curious uh, to, to learn a bit more. Um, yeah. Okay? Yeah, really, really, uh, really, um, really relevant and insightful questions, James. Um, I think um, in terms of the new structure in integrated care systems, I think we've been trying to um, create this structure over a number of years so and and I can give my experiences from being in the NHS um, both as a local leader you, you in the Windsor Ascot and Maidenhead area and then now as a national leader so so within um, I think what we what we want to do is to devolve the responsibility down to those local levels this is not um, a top-down approach this is a building up approach um, and and so be it to be able to um, um, what we what we what we're wanting to do is to um, allow those 42 systems to be able to use their money wisely and support um, that health improvement um, and that will be um, supported by regional support and national support so the regional uh, teams, um, we've got um, uh, regional teams throughout um, um, England, seven regional teams, who are there to really support each of those ICSs in delivering what their plans are for their population and by living within the resources that they've got. And at a national level, we also want to be doing that, um, but we also want to make sure that those systems are accountable um, to their populations, but also to the spend and the money that um, is allocated to them. And so there's a role in terms of the national system in, 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 in that responsibility around that, 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 those, those finances, which, are, which obviously um, has been taken through a process of changing the law so that we've actually kind of changed the law so that it incorporates all of that kind of um, those financial flows of money and accountability um, down to that local level. 
So, so I think that structure, um, James, around kind of ICS has been um, devolved a responsibility, regionally supported, um, nationally supported through policy changes. And, you know, we've had a recent big policy change around, as you might know, virtual wards and the investment of half a billion pounds of money into a national scheme to invest um, in um, um, care in people's own homes. Um, that is um, a national policy, but we're allowing that to be um, uh, created at that local level where they know their workforce, they know what resources they've got to be able to allocate that, and we've got regional teams to support that piece of work. So that's just an example of how um, at, a, at a national and a local level we're, we're implementing some of this integration agenda. Um, for me, and you talked about pitfalls, this is all about relationships. There's nothing simpler than that. It's about relationships and how people, um, as system leaders, get on, um, understand each other, and work together to be able to, to, to use those resources wisely and to improve those population health outcomes. And that's about the system leaders, whether they are in health or whether they're in care, coming together with a mutual understanding and creating the right space for them to be, um, be supportive in terms of those needs, whether it's to the citizen as a, um, as a care um, um, leader or whether it's to the um, patient if it, as a healthcare leader. We need to get people connected to, and in my own system, the Frimley Health and Care System, which was one of the first integrated care systems in the country, um, a lot of that attention was paid in terms of creating and fostering those relationships so that we can be in a good position to be able to to, to work together on things. And whether that's the ambulances at the front door of the hospital approach, or whether it's the approach which is around um, some of the prevention agenda that we've just been talking about, um, having that joined up um, leadership is really important to be able to um, make good decisions, make wise decisions with, with the resources that are, that are around within that ICS. And having that structure at an ICS board level is really important. And then at an ICS partnership, where all the providers come together to be able to deliver that care. So it's, we've moved a little bit away from the, the commissioner provider split to, to now this kind of responsibility at an ICS type of level. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. That's very helpful uh, indeed. Um, just to let the audience know, I think we are doing good time. Be patient before we hit the open Q&A session and, you know, your comments must be so captivating because I noticed that no question has come in online yet. So this is just a small nudge to our dear audience and don't be shy, can put your question in. Now, Jonathan, I have actually two questions for you and myself ask, ask you together, right? So the first one is to comment on the same one uh, question I had earlier is uh, as medical costs continue to rise. Right. How can industry players uh, make healthcare more affordable and accessible? And the next question, and I might well ask you now, how can we use digital technologies to address emerging health needs? What is the biggest benefit that technology will have on aging and longevity? I think they are very closely linked, the questions. So appreciate if you could uh, share with us your insights on them. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think for the benefits wise, I think it's 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 clear uh, that digital and 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 uh, efforts as well as technology can help in this space. But it's really about the challenges that we face in trying to get people to adopt such uh, digital uh, approaches as well as uh, leveraging technology for for healthcare. So the way we see uh, affordability, it's really uh, more aligned with um, the preventative as well as the, the predictive nature of of uh, uh, a perspective. So obviously if we can steer you clear of you know, chronic illnesses uh, or let you know early, a trip to the GP would cost significantly less than say a trip to the ICU. So that's really where we, we see the leveraging our technologies to enable you to find out a little bit more about your health, uh, be a little bit more uh, intimate with your health indicators and take action early if there are trending information that you are headed towards a, a known area of caution. Uh, or even if you are in, in the pink of health, 
at least continue in that that good trajectory. Um, so that that would bring me to the second question, which is what what are the, the real challenges, right? So we have seen based on our own UX research groups is that uh, uh, users typically don't like to be nagged, right? And you don't like to be you don't like to know that you're sedentary, even though you know you've been sitting in the computer for the last eight hours. You've not been for a run. Um, some wearables would say, "Hey, you've not moved. Uh, get up and move." Uh, and we have not we've seen that adoption rates. Uh, would typically fall, right? You would think that it's it's naggy. You stop using it. You put it to silent. You close notifications. Uh, so we, we have seen a, a lot more successes in our, our current engagement app uh, uh, levels with, within our own demo app called the Mental Health. It's at 45%. May not be significantly high, but it's a lot higher than the, the typical wearable engagement rates of about 12%. And, and how we have done it differently is through a series of uh, meaningful engagement uh, gamification and as uh, Dr. Serrat has also mentioned, uh, incentivization, right? So in terms of engagement, we we want to make the, the journey meaningful, right? We, we are helping companies uh, like Prudential that has got a lot of uh, a wealth of resources on, on meaningful interventions that you can try either be it in the, the mental wellness space or the physical uh, fitness space. Uh, but how do we leveraging AI? curate a journey that's meaningful for you. So you do very little searching. Uh, recommendations are based on your current physical and mental indicators. Uh, recommendations are directly given to you. Uh, and then if you were to follow these recommendations through a gamified process, we unlock incentive incentives to you. And we have found this to, to really work. Obviously, it's uh, as Dr. Seha has mentioned, this is really the holy grail. Uh, the nagging one, we have already done, tried. It, it doesn't uh, really stick. But to to create a, a game where you see yourself growing in this journey, and through self reflection also, you feel that you are indeed getting better, uh, uh, and and feeling you know uh, uh, more energy, more uh, uh, better mental place, uh, and then now you also see the amount of incentives that has been unlocked through the the year or two journey that you've been with the app uh, to also encourage that level of stickiness within the app. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, good results in terms of engagement that comes from this space. So in terms of also creating the accessibility, uh, making sure that our uh, technology, the ability to get your vital signs via video feed with medical grade accuracies, we have to make sure that it works across all phones in the Android and iOS sphere. So this is also a, a big bulk of uh, our resources that we have put into making sure everybody can be part of this. Uh, we want people to enjoy this game, this experience, this, this uh, meaningful engagement journey as well as benefit from there in terms of your own life uh, and enjoy the preventive and, and predictive uh, um, analysis that comes from the engagement of the app. Thank you, Jonathan. Then uh, Adrian, would you want to comment on how yeah. uh, digital technology can, can help uh, you know, play a role yeah. on aging and longevity? Yeah, thanks. Well, you Re really interesting, Jonathan. Um, I think you know. I think one of the first things I, I, I'd actually say is that we need to learn from I innovators like Jonathan, um, and and just what he described just there actually actually reminded me of a conversation I had recently with one of our clinical entrepreneurs. So I just wanted to briefly just talk about our clinical entrepreneur program, if that, if I may. Um, in, in England, um, we have um, set up, and we set this up about five years ago, um, through maybe six years ago, through a national lead called Tony Young. And he's developed a program called the Clinical Entrepreneur Program, a really successful program, which is just doing um, and listening to, to, to people like Jonathan um, and investing in those people to, to support them with uh, mentoring, um, un an understanding of the health community and thinking about how their um, their business can really add value to healthcare, and um, we we've invested you know near uh, it, the investment in that small program has grown over the years and there's nearly kind of eight or nine thousand clinical entrepreneurs in in England at the moment who have their own small businesses and are supporting that and some of that um, has brought in lots of funding so nearly three or four hundred million pounds worth of funding has kind of come into some of these um, these entrepreneurial kind of schemes um, and um, this goes throughout kind of a lot of um, not only doctors but medical students um, dietitians a whole range of clinical
clinicians and actually wider than that, going into the community and thinking about community leaders as well um, are, are supporting this. And recently it's been adopted in Australia. So Australia have just um, started their clinical entrepreneur program as well. So we believe by investing in entrepreneurs like Jonathan um, and supporting them, we can find some of these solutions that are really important um, to be able to um, kind of bring technology um, into um, into the in, into to normal domain. And one one of the schemes is a scheme um, called Apian, actually, who are now using drone technology to be able to deliver um, supplies between hospitals um, in in England. So investing in a company like that, which was founded by two medical students, um, investing in those people to bring that technology brings that added value healthcare to the NHS, um, which is which is fantastic. Um, um, so listening to Jonathan, just, just where he was saying that, I, I recently um, met with one of our clinical entrepreneurs who's got an interest in, she's a geriatrician, and she really wanted to think about how we incentivize not, not the user, but also the people who work in care to understand healthcare a bit better. And, and so it's not only the users, but it's also the professionals that can support some of um, this innovation and this digital technology. And instead of um, giving them a course, which they have to sit um, either an online course or a, or, 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 um, a course, which is um, a, a structured regulated course, a lot of the care sector employees um, have, a, have, a, have a lower than average reading age and they're gonna be delivering care to our most vulnerable uh, people. So we need to think of a different way of supporting their knowledge and understanding. And using gaming technology was my suggestion actually to them to, to, to think about that, because I think we have to think about a new way of actually, rather than kind of going through some of the traditional ways in order to get the messages across and be able to, to use that technology in the right kind of way. So, so I think investing in understanding where entrepreneurs can really kind of now take us to a really new level of thinking about tech and innovation is really where we are in, in, in England and in the UK, hopefully leading um, the support for some of those clinical entrepreneurs. And, um, and also, you know, that spreads into international um, innovations. Um, and, and internationally, we've got um, at least um, 20 or 30 innovations which are being adopted internationally as well as nationally. So this isn't, isn't just about England and the UK. We can produce this ecostructure across the world where innovators can come and we can rapidly get that employed and devolved into healthcare um, wherever ever that might be, whether it's Singapore or England or Australia. Thanks, um, Adrian. Um, Siddharth, would you like to share your thoughts um, on the use of um, digital technology, right, to help with aging and uh, longevity? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks. Thanks, James. I think, uh, but before I share my thoughts, probably it's so exciting to hear from Jonathan and from Adrian, you know, that health tech is the future. You know, whatever Jonathan spoke about, whatever Adrian spoke about, you know, it seems that health tech is here to stay and is going to help people lead a healthy life in whichever form but it's definitely going to be a key enabler so so we all seem to be on the right track and this seems to be the very appropriate platform to discuss the future of health tech as we speak here today uh, yes i think uh, for us at prudential you know when we were mulling about the fact that how does health tech come into picture and help our our policyholders our customers in terms of you know uh, living a healthy life and aging uh, with good health. And we also thought about the fact that how can we move away from the label of a conventional insurance company and get into a space where we are no more an insurance company per se, but let's say a wellness company. And that's where we thought about how do we bring in health tech as a platform uh, to offer the best of health tech services to our policyholders bring in great partners to work with, uh, for example, Novotech, yeah? And to understand how really our policyholders could take uh, or avail benefit from this platform or, or the health tech that could be really brought in for the, uh, for the policyholders. So in this context, we really thought through this and we thought, okay, if we do something in piecemeal, it, it's, it's not something that's really adding value to uh, 
the life of our customer, the policyholder. So therefore, we thought of developing an end-to-end -end digital healthcare ecosystem, which was something very unique. Now, when I say an end-to-end -end digital healthcare ecosystem, I mean an ecosystem that understands your health, that gives you recommendations, that links you to a medical practitioner, that links you to specialist care, and that links you to everything day in and day out that's really required from a normal healthcare perspective, which links you to health screening facilities. So what we did was we launched a healthcare application, which is called Pulse, P Pulse as in the human pulse, Pulse by Prudential. And this is a health, uh, health tech application that really covers the end-to-end -end of the healthcare ecosystem. Now, when I say that, I mean that it's it's got a functionality that really does health screening for you to actually tell the user in terms of how healthy or unhealthy the person is based on the inputs by the user. Subsequently, it's got something that we call a symptom checker, which uh, we have partnered with Babylon and Adrian might have probably heard about them because you know it's in the press in the UK these days. Yeah, so 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 we partnered with Babylon to provide us the platform for a symptom checker which actually in Singapore is not a GP, is not a doctor, but it really guides the user to the potential causes of whatever symptoms the person might be having. We then uh, partnered with telemedicine and telehealth providers who are licensed by Ministry of Singapore, Ministry of Health Singapore to provide the customers with access to doctors over the telephone, video calls. And, and this all was introduced during uh, the time when the pandemic just hit us. So it was a very timely entrant to the market which Prudential bought for our policyholders. And, and as we expanded the scope, as we extended the scope of this uh, telehealth or this uh, health tech application, we slowly added more features that really sort of added value from a healthcare perspective for the policyholders, for them to better understand how healthy they are. And if they discovered some abnormalities, some anomalies in their healthcare, they could seek timely healthcare advice. So it was all about, you know, uh, Prudential's idea of prevention, prevention and prevention, which sort of then leads to protection and postponement of health conditions. So today, besides all these functionalities, what we have also introduced in this healthcare app is uh, the functionality for users to measure their vital signs. For example, the heart rate, for example, uh, the respiration rate, uh, for example, the oxygen saturation levels, which has become such a common thing since the pandemic has hit us, you know, and, and this all by simply scanning their face with a mobile phone. Once the app is in the mobile phone, they just scan their face with the mobile phone. And the results are obtained instantly. So whilst there are many health tech apps in the market that could give all these uh, piecemeal solutions, but what we did is we got all this together on a single platform. And that's why I say that this is an healthcare ecosystem that we have. And what is the benefit for us going forward as a healthcare financier? So what we believe is that this will help the users. And for this healthcare application, we have not restricted the usage to our policyholders. We have opened the usage to all the residents in Singapore, irrespective of whether they are our customers or not, because th th there's an intent to basically, uh, you know, let every common man have access to this healthcare platform so that they know how they stand in terms of their health and wellness. And from there, we believe that if people are able to timely detect using this health tech solution, are able to timely detect their anomalies, are able to understand what they should do next in terms of their healthcare requirements, are able to access doctors and specialists through their phone without even leaving their home. This will sort of motivate people to take care of their health more aggressively or more proactively. And that could, at the end of the day, be a good sign for us as a healthcare financer where our customers are healthy, which means less healthcare expenditures, which means less hospitalizations, which means less treatment. So this is where we believe as an organization and where I individually, uh, personally as a doctor also believe that the future is health tech and this is really going to help us in making healthcare sustainable. And, and it was a pleasure for me to hear similar sentiments from Jonathan, similar sentiments from Adrian when he spoke about NHS and the integrated healthcare systems that are operating there. So, so it seems as, as we are all aging from a global perspective, we are also looking at solutions that could really sort of 
mitigate the risks coming out of uh, aging. And one of them is health tech and technology in the healthcare sector. So we seem to be on the right path and let's see where this takes up, but very excited to hear from you, Adrian and Jonathan about the future of health tech. Back to you, James. Thanks, Sinhat. Can definitely feel your high level excitement about the opportunity this, this approach is, is giving. Um, on, on that note, the Q&A session is now officially open. Again, I urge you, if you have any questions, um, just put it in the Q&A segment and then we'll come to them. Um, perhaps I can get the ball rolling. A, a question to Jonathan and Adrian. And Jonathan first, in, you, you, because you shared about um, um, pushing the technology to end user and how they don't like to be nagged, right? I was wondering from the healthcare providers perspective, particularly the doctors, um, are, are, is there any fear of information overload and medical legal fears of missing out signals and not taking action? And then you get, you know, you get sued for it. So if, if Jonathan and, and Adrian can, can share your experience in this, please, and Jonathan. Thanks for the question. Um, so yes, absolutely. That with the the high adoption of wearables, we we do see a, a a new challenge where even if you went to go see a GP for a condition, uh, really the, the doctors don't have the time to screen through every single raw data point across the last thirty days, for example, and make sense of uh, those data sets that has been collected. So even if you had an app, uh, it's been tracking you over the last thirty days. It, there really isn't that capacity to go through your day by day and to, to try and spot these trends to identify what could be the underlying uh, issues that you're facing. So that's really where we would leverage um, uh, AI to take over, uh, look at these data sets, learn from these data sets, either from clinical data sets that we get from our partners, and then make these predictions over the data sets that you have and have them as uh, recommendations for the doctors that you see. Um, regulatory wise, yes, that there is obviously that risk uh, so starting from our RPPG, so the remote photoplasmography technology that we have, uh, we are uh, and have gotten very good accuracies from uh, that algorithm, and we will continue to push for them to at least have a HSA Class B certification. That would mean that the results that it, it uh, detects can be used for medical diagnosis because it's a, a, a medical-grade device. Uh, beyond this, obviously, to create uh, software as a medical device, AI systems that will be able to, to find the trending information from the scans that you take daily, make recommendations for your GP to take note of, that would be the next standard that we're looking for. So it's really not a, the AI would replace your doctor. Uh, it's really more about how do we leverage AI to augment your doctor to make better decisions, to give you better insights, to take the, the active steps to uh, attain better quality of life. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Adrian? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think um, there's a number of things. Um, uh, first, in terms of, um, I think I very much agree with Jonathan around kind of how um, we need to be able to use technology around the amount of data, but also the different data fields that are coming in as well. So it may be that you, you, you've got a wearable device and there's a lot of data fields coming in from that. You may also have a, a longitudinal health record. And, you know, in, in the UK, we're very much blessed because, you know, um, in terms of an electronic health record um, in general practice, we've had that probably since the 1980s. So actually, we've got a, a wealth of data who, which has come in about a person's long term health history. We're getting hospital record data, but also social care data. So how do we make a best use of that intelligence that's there? to be able to make really good decisions as a clinician on the ground. I think we're going to have to learn as clinicians in the future how to do that and how to do that in a way that really meets the needs of the person in front of us in a 10 minute consultation or a half an hour consultation, um, uh, really important. Um, the second thing is around information governance. And I think we need to be really clear and, and, and work really hard to make sure that um, people's, um, and in, in England, um, we, we want to make sure that people's rights are respected and that we make sure that um, um, the, 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 the information about them doesn't go into the wrong place so that it's not the, 
the the professional in front of them that's uh, got getting that information it's other people so information governance is really important and and in in our own system we've worked really hard at kind of understanding that through those relationships that i talked about earlier um, and our relationships with our citizens as well which is really important around understanding where data can be used and how it can be used in the right kind of way um, I think the third uh, thing, element is around health inequalities, and I wanted to, to, to just flag it up because um, we also have to think, you know, we talked about pulse oximetry. We've just got to make sure that the technology is suitable for the use in, uh, in all situations. And, you know, it's amazing um, in, in healthcare, we, you know, very much think about a white Caucasian type of population for all kinds of things, whether it's a blood result, which kind of are parameters around that white Caucasian population. Um, but actually, we really need to think, refocus and rethink the way that we kind of think about monitoring. And, you know, is pulse oximetry relevant and, and, and the same for every individual, whatever, whatever your skin colour, is, really, is a really important question. So we have to always be thinking about that and, and making sure that we're not going to be increasing the health inequality agenda. Um, uh, and we're, we're putting some really serious thought about that into the NHS and, and how we do things. And then the role of the regulators, finally, the role of the regulators in, in ensuring some of that health tech. So we, we've got the, um, um, the MHRA, which is our, our, our regulator around medicines and devices, where they're, they're putting a lot of thought about that. We've got the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, the NICE, who are actually also are putting a lot of thought into how devices are used in the clinical space to be able to regulate be regulated um, and we've also got um, uh, our, our, our regulators who inspect uh, CQC to be able to be thinking about how those devices are used and I, I talked about the virtual ward as a new way of working which is around using some of this remote monitoring around devices blood pressure pulse um, um, oxygen such saturations temperature um, being able to do that um, and do, have that remote monitoring in people's own homes so that um, we can um, uh, assess their situation remotely and also send out professionals to them or kind of work with them for acute illnesses like like chest infections or covid um, or, or, or or even um, um, people living with frailty who really do want to be treated and supported in their own homes with any therapies that um, they might need during an acute exacerbation um, of that illness which would have normally taken them into hospital we need to be able to think very much about those devices how they're used how they're used in that context making sure that we offer a personalized approach. And this is the really important thing, um, which uh, I think we've got to really kind of think about. And it's part of our long-term plan in the NHS to have a personalized care um, as part of that. And that personalized care is around making those decisions with the individual about um, their readings, their assessments, and whether it's me in general practice, thinking about that with all these, all this information in front of me, all this technical information in front of me, what's important is that shared decision between the professional and between the patient to make the right decision for them in that particular circumstances. And that will vary from a young 20 year old with a particular health problem to a, a 90 year old with a particular health problem. We need to make that care personalized and that approach personalized to be able to deliver the best outcomes for our populations um, using um, some of this technology. And I, I think th that brings it together in terms of how we develop um, you know, the, the use of digital technology in the right way um, over time. Thank you, Adrian. Definitely, I think having very clear boundaries or engagement for yeah. all stakeholders yeah, will, will help uh, adoption. I'm actually quite sad to announce, I think we have 10 to 15 minutes left. So I'm going to try to plan this properly to, to get the most out of our panel. Um, I'm going to ask you a slightly more provoking question. Right? Uh, we go one round and then we'll end off with your one point, right, that you hope the audience will take away. So the, well, might be mildly provocative. And uh, I'll start off with uh, Siddharth. You obviously deal with many stakeholders, right? What are some of the frustrations, you know, uh, you may have with some of them? Now, don't be too frank. Um, that you think is, is just slowing down uh, uh, um, a chance of success, you know, a possibility of success. So could you just share um, what example or some of this frustration? Then I'll go to Jonathan and, and then Adrian. Uh, Siddharth, sorry to put you on the spot. 
Well, you've already sensitized me that I need not be frank about this. So I really don't know <laughs> what, what to answer, yeah? But more than happy to address this from a healthcare financing perspective. But but before I do that, probably I, I just want to go back to uh, to Adrian and, and just to add to the, the observations he made just a minute on that. So, so one, you spoke about information governance. I think, Adrian, that's absolutely vital. And even for us here in Singapore, that's that's really sort of sacrosanct, if I may use that term. And, and we really, whatever we are trying to do on the technology platform, on the health tech platform, we really have to consider all these issues around information governance. And then uh, we, we have a law in place in Singapore called the PDPA, which is the Personal Data Protection Act, which is sort of uh, structured around this information governance. So, so. So yes, I understand that it's a key uh, matter of uh, vital matter in, in the UK, but believe you me, in Singapore, we have a similar thing where we are really sort of focusing on this information governance. And and to the extent when we uh, went out to the market with our health tech offering, you know, uh, it was initially received by a bit of skepticism by our users because the question was, guys, you are an insurance company. What are you going to do with my health data? You know? very obvious and valid question right so so we had really generated awareness that we are not leveraging of this data this data is not with us and it's the partners on our platform who are providing services are directly using that data for healthcare provision but beyond that we do not see your data we do not know what is there in the data and we do not use it for any other purpose because we don't have access to it so so yeah i fully agree with the point you made and secondly, I was heartening to hear that, you know, in, in the UK, you've already, and probably it's because of the NHS system in place where at-home technologies to support chronic diseases are really sort of getting prevalent, yeah? And for us in Singapore, we are still not there to a great extent. And, and that's maybe one of the reasons is that uh, there is no such support from a financing perspective available today for such at-home technologies, which means, uh, you, know, you know, the insurance doesn't cover that or, or even the public health schemes do not cover that. But I believe if we have to sort of control healthcare costs in the future, knowing that the population is aging, this would be something key for us to understand how do we go ahead and support this? So currently we don't have data, we don't have enough information to really know how, what's the cost of all this. But going forward, this is the future. It is something that we have to take care of place, of people using technology within their homes, and that will give a very positive result for all the stakeholders. So that's so that's talking about, you know, just adding to what you said, Adrian. So James, coming back to your point, I think, if, if you recall, uh, when I spoke about the need for a, a multi-stakeholder, uh, I would say, approach in terms of working together and integration of multi-stakeholders in this entire ecosystem, if we have to deliver on sustainable healthcare. I think from a Singapore context today, and if I put on my cap as an insurer, uh, and be very honest with you, from a Singapore context today, uh, maybe the, the interests of each of the stakeholders are not aligned. Yeah, uh, and the way healthcare is structured uh, from an insurance perspective, it's a fee for service model. So my interest cannot be aligned with the interest of let's say a hospital or a specialist because uh, the more services are utilized by the uh, patient or, or by the user, it's, it's more beneficial or it brings in more revenue or it brings in more benefits for the healthcare provider. But this necessarily is not helping the healthcare financer. So there's always this dichotomy that there's a conflict of interest in this stakeholder approach. And until we don't move away from this fee for service model to a uh, value for care model, right? Where the intent and interest is no more around overutilization because that's really not helping the healthcare provider. Till then we will see these frustrations and challenges as you use the term frustrations. Uh, these are going to be there. Uh, but hopefully we are slowly moving towards that. There's a realization that uh, that's coming out on us that, you know, this is not a sustainable model at the end of the day. You know, a fee-for-service model, uh, the more you utilize, the more you get paid for. It's not, it's a, it's a zero-sum game, honestly, for the end user, which is the consumer. Now, how soon we'll be able to move to different models and whether they would work, I mean, Look, I don't have a crystal ball, but probably if, if you look at uh, MOH's announcement around 
one GP for one family and then the GP developing care programs. And this is coming up next year. This probably to me is the first step in that direction where we'll slowly move away from this conflict of interest sort of a situation. So those are those are my real frustrations as of now, James. Okay, I, I, I have not been very frank. No, no, you have not. Uh, I do share, I, I do think that everybody needs to own the system and ensure the sustainability of the system. I've been reminded by our organizers that we are really running out of time. So um, I'm going to go straight into asking you to make that uh, one point that you would like the audience to take home with them. Um, starting from um, Dr. Adrian, would you like to share? No, thank you. Really interesting um, webinar. And um, for me, um, I think this webinar demonstrates that digital healthcare is for all, not just for the few, um, and that we can bring healthy aging across a life course. And I think in England, we'd say, um, especially as I'm a GP, from cradle to grave, we need to be able to do, be doing that. So for me, it's about really it being for all, um, not just for the few. Thank you, Adrian. And um, Jonathan, would you like to share one point? Yeah. So um, I think being uh, uh, innovators in this space, obviously, uh, uh, the, the, the biggest takeaway is it, it is a challenging path, right? Both in terms of the confidence of our, our technology, as well as trying to engage the adoption. Uh, so uh, we, we're very lucky to have our uh, medical partners, uh, NHS included, that have done their feasibility studies and have seen these accuracies and will continue to work with us. Uh, so in this space, uh, in our mission and vision to truly enable healthcare to be anywhere, uh, we, we will continue to push and uh, show credibility while mass adoption uh, on, a, on a larger scale. Uh, with that in mind also, we are expanding our team. So for our audience out there, a shameless plug. If you're interested to join this team and, and take on this challenge, we are, we are more than uh, happy to have a chat with you. Well done, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Sita, you have the last say. Okay, so from my side, the thing I want to say is that there's no one size fits all. So we need to have a multi-pronged approach to solve our healthcare challenges. And when I say that, all the stakeholders, they need to work together. Prevention over protection is the key message once the stakeholders are working together. Technology is definitely a part of the solution. That's the future. And lastly, the systems need to be integrated where you know the value-based care has to come into the Singapore market. If these all things sort of gel together, I think we might have a solution to this issue of sustainable healthcare in the long run for an aging population. Thank you, Sita. Um, Priya, then may I have permission to bring the session to a close? Dr. Lam, actually, uh, how would you like to say something, perhaps, you know, as yes. moderator, you have listened to, you know, all the panelists uh, say their piece. Any last thoughts from you or what would you like our audience to take away with, oh. take away well, from this session? I plan it so well, so that I don't need to make a closing and you put <laughs> me on the spot. I, yes, yeah, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I really don't want to repeat all the many good points um, our speakers have shared. Uh, I, I think a few, a few, key points uh, ring very loud in my, in my head, right? Instead of um, healthcare, you know, health promotion and prevention, right, we need to start young. We need to be open-minded about adopting technology, right? And it's all integrated, right? It's integrated across a society as shared by Dr. Adrian. Right? And last but not the least, we must all take ownership, like Sita have shared, of the system, right? The system, cannot fail. We all live in the system, right? If it gets unsustainable, unaffordable, we will all suffer. So it's not too late to pick up that tennis racket and uh, you just need to imagine an agent's amount at 86, right? If I'm not wrong, by right? hitting the tennis balls three times a week. So with that, uh, it's been my great pleasure to have moderated uh, today's panel. I would like to thank uh, all the, the speakers uh, for the great discussion and sharing and, you know, sharing all their wonderful insight uh, throughout the session. I would also like to thank, of course, uh, the British Chamber of Commerce and Prudential for organizing and, and making today's session possible. And last but not the least, definitely, I'd like to thank the audience um, for your time. I hope 
you found the, the, the session uh, useful and maybe thought provoking, or uh, hopefully uh, a call to action on our individual part. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, and, and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thanks everybody. for joining us and thanks to the panelists. This brings us to the end of the webinar. Have a great rest of the day. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.